Thanks for checking out the Christy Mayer podcast. We are on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the notification icon. And if you're on iTunes, please go subscribe and leave a sexy or creepy review on there. I will be reading the best or worst reviews every week so long as they are five stars. I am so excited to have this guy on the podcast today. Uh, we are first and foremost compound media buddies, uh, bonded by our mutual free speech network. <laughs> he is the um, one of the hosts of Two Drink Minimum on the network, and he has a new special out on YouTube right now called Infamous. Mr. Mike Ward, how are you? I'm good, Chrissy. How are you? Oh, I'm good. You know, just surviving through the quar <laughs> how is it now in new york is it still crazy or it's gotten better it's interesting because the the cl- none of the, the clubs aren't open there have been a few you know secret shows uh up here in westchester where i live which is like about you know 40 minutes outside the city and they'll be in like people's backyards or you know secret locations where like it's okay you know we're, you can't call it a show it's got to be like you know just an event or like people having dinner outside and then <laughs> comedians show up so uh but nothing that you can charge tickets for so okay. it's some places will be like all right we'll feed you if it's in this guy's backyard we know he feeds us he likes to cook a lot and then maybe there'll be like a hat passed around um which has been good for, you know, getting the bugs out and just, you know, all the comics are saying like gigs that we wouldn't have even given two seconds about, you know, like we never would have done these kinds of gigs just a few months ago. Now it's like, Oh, there's a backyard part, you know, backyard show somewhere. Let me add it. Where, where can I go? Um, and, uh, I haven't been to the city since like March 17th. And uh, I actually talked to Don Jameson the other day at um, Anthony Cumia's 4th of July party. And Don was like, yeah, I do my show in the afternoons. And I I start to feel like a little bit unsafe. Like he said he was walking to do his show. I guess it was this week or last week. Um, Oh, right. There's no shows like this whole week. So it must have been like last couple of weeks. He said he like looked over his shoulder, saw a guy like straight up looking him up and down, not in like a fun gay way, but in a like he was checking him out and then looking around to see who was like about to like size him up to possibly oh, mug shit. him. Yeah. And, and it really I could tell it really kind of freaked him out a little bit. And uh, from what I've heard from like my the cops that I know, you know, crime's gone up like 400 percent gun sales are up in this country 400 percent um it's like you can't get a you know a gun anywhere even if you wanted i'm sure there's probably a way but um it's just like amazing to see how just maybe six months ago the kind of people that would like jump all over you for mentioning a gun like now it's like so not a thing that's like the one (laughs) thing that people have sort of given up on because it's it's just like crazy out there and it's weird because I haven't been in the city yet to feel like the crime. Um, but if it's like, if, if Don is saying it, then it's like, okay, he's not like yeah. a wuss. He's like a dude. So it's the seventies yeah. again. That's remember- what I've heard. Yeah. I heard it's going to like come back like full on. And my other friend who works in the city is like, yeah, there's just so much the homeless have sort of like come up out of the woodwork. Like there's just more around. So it's crazy here in Montreal. It's good now. It's, oh yeah. It's all, yeah. We started doing shows again uh, last week. The club started opening up again and uh, yeah, it's, it's still weird, but uh, at least, at least we're, we have shows again. Are there, do they have like the tables spread out? Are, are, they, are the audience wearing yeah. masks? Like the, I, I own a comedy club and it's a hundred seater and we can only fit 40, 40 people in the room and we need to get plexiglass to separate the tables. Because if we didn't have the plexiglass, we could only get 30 people in the room. So by adding plexiglass, we get another 10, which is shit. Like, but at least it's 40 people in a small room. Yeah, yeah. And that's about like what we're getting in, on these secret shows. Um, but as, there's also like no rules. People are kind of sitting wherever. Yeah. It's like kind of at your own risk. But 
how how has it felt for you like getting back and performing again like uh, i haven't even done it. my first show is on sunday oh wow okay yeah yeah because they started up again because i was getting calls for shows like do you want to do a show in front of uh like a, a drive-in crowd and people will be in the car and i was like i don't want to do that like i've I have yeah. money in the bank. I don't, I don't need to <laughs> fucking like go, go to a drive-in. So I've been saying no to everything. And then uh, when the show started up again, they figured I'd say no because I was saying no to everything. But then when, when I found out it was in a real room, I was super excited. And it's funny that it's my club and I found out late. That, yeah. Because that, <laughs> I've, I've been... Like I almost, almost on vacation. Like I've, I, I was like, fuck it. I bought a house in the country. Oh wow! And yeah. So I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to live my life out of, you know, out of the city until all of this dies down. That's what I think. So many people are doing. Like so many people are just friends that I see, like talking about it on social media. Like they are wanting to get out of the city. A lot of people are looking at like Westchester and Jersey when they wouldn't have thought of it before because like oh it's too far away and you know you don't want to be far from the city you got to be close to the clubs and my commute is like an hour and a half in you know and then like hour and a half back and like sometimes it bothers me but like now it's it's like I'm kind of grateful you're so happy yeah 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 so it'll be interesting to see like how many how many people in comics like end up moving up this way but then there's also like a few comics that live in like Stamford and like you know, which is kind of like same amount of distance, but like towards Connecticut. Um, it's going to be yeah. weird, like in, in a couple of months, because all of like uh, smaller markets are opening up again. But New York and L.A. are are it's it's tougher. So in like six months, comics from like little shitty towns are going to be like, you know, doing a bunch of shows. So they're going to be kind of good and all of the the comics that are really good are going to be doing these weird backyard shows so so it's going to change the dynamic yeah it's like it's interesting like ah there's part of you that's like okay i am too good for this kind of show i guess it's like do you you know if you if you if you're not going to do any show that doesn't pay right are you then losing out because you're not getting a chance to like slough off that rust yeah, um, I'm going to be yeah. so rusty. I'm going to be <laughs> so bad. <laughs> yeah, on the very first, like, secret show we had in Westchester, uh, it was funny because, like, both me and Luz J. Gomez, we were both kind of like, no, we're not bombing. We just don't remember our jokes. It's a <laughs> difference between bombing and not remembering. And now I see a lot of, the, like, what you described, like, comedy out of the pickup truck. Um, the, those shows are happening, like, quite quite often in Astoria, Queens, and then people in their cars it's like right instead of laughing you're gonna honk yeah which must suck for crowd work how yeah. do you like because even when you're on stage it's tough to see people if they're not in the front row so if they're in their car you're like talking to what you think is a man but it's a woman and it yeah. must just be super awkward yeah it's like oh man hey you at the tinted windows like roll it down i can't see yeah. you or like <laughs> yeah do you end up just like shitting on people's cars um like license plates yeah i'll probably end up doing one of those like at this point there's like i'm not i'm kind of not better than anything at this point um i want it's funny yeah it's funny how we miss like even even the shitty things about our job we i i miss now like everything i like i really like comedy but there are some things that used to annoy me and now i i'd kill for those things that annoy me. What were like, like the top three things that annoyed you? Uh, it was mostly, um, it, it was always people after the show. Uh, <laughs> it, like yeah. I'm, 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 I don't, I, I don't like people in my bubble. So whenever I'd have like people that were very touchy feely, I fucking hated that. But I miss having like weird semi autistic creeps <laughs> <laughs> touching me. So you were about the social distancing even before it was yeah, popular. Exactly. Yeah. You were just like, get away from me. Okay. So the, so like semi creepy fans after the show. The uh, audience that gets uh, offended over everything. That's the thing I hate, but I think I'd, I'd almost enjoy that now just to see that uh, someone's <laughs> listening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the third thing, I don't know. I think it's uh I hate it when people 
uh, come up to you after a show and say, I want to be a comic. And then they Ugh. ask you for advice. But it's they, the if, worst time. Yeah. And if you give them whatever you tell them, they argue with you and they're like, no, I'll do it like this. And you're like, then why, why did you ask me? Like, yeah. just. I, is it because most people want, they want like a step-by-step, -step, like, okay, what's my five-step plan to get yeah. to be where you are? And you can't simplify it. Like, even if I were to give somebody who's newer the, my exact path, even if they followed it, it's not going to lead them to the same. I had no yeah. idea that this path was going to lead me here. I just was like, I kept sort of trying stuff and, you know, work hard at something. It's not working. Move on. Yeah. I think yeah. that's a trick. Just work until you find something that, that, that works for you. Yeah. And, and also I would say like, you know, try to find out who likes you and where to get more of those people. Yeah. You know, like what you're, demographics are but it's interesting because like me on stage i really appeal to women but my my like t my whatever online analytics and stuff like my youtube and twitter stuff is like 91 percent male yeah like, i just <laughs> realized like that was my audience so i was like oh man i gotta i gotta do more makeup tutorials i gotta figure <laughs> something out i gotta reach the women online um why do you think uh, you're not getting women online Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I started, uh, I really started ramping up this podcast in the quarantine and I've been interviewing comics, uh, more like libertarian type personalities, some like social media influencers. Um, but it's kind of more in that. I mean, I had, I had one interview that was like, uh, she was one of the girls that called out Harvey Weinstein when he was at like a club in New York City. Okay. Um, but mostly they've been more, I don't even know if I want to say conservative, I'm maybe more libertarian, maybe more like free speech type people. Um, and I think about like, if I was uh, me, but not a comedian, like what, what am I interested in online? Like mostly Pinterest, Instagram, fashion stuff, makeup stuff. Um, you know, I don't know. That's the thing. It's like, if I didn't have, it's so hard. I don't know. I just, but I also don't think there are a lot of women doing what I'm doing, like comedy and also, you know, these kind of like more in-depth yeah. interviews and the kinds of people that I'm interviewing because I'm not like a super woke liberal. So, yeah. So I don't know. I Maybe I will start with the, with the makeup tutorials and maybe I'll like I'll, uh, tape myself going through my, like, or Marie condoing my closet, you know, like I'll be like folding everything. <laughs> um but it's interesting that you say you actually miss offending people because uh mike you're you know as you know as maybe some of you might not know mike is kind of in the middle of a tricky situation that started about four years ago um basically mike offended this guy he he was like a disabled singer he had something called treacher collins syndrome which is like your bones don't develop and he was like this make a wish type kid and he was a singer and he, i think he sung for the pope and celine dion and um mike said kind of like really i mean i thought pretty harmless you know, joke on a special, he basically was like, oh, like, why isn't he dead yet? You know, this is this Make-A-Wish kid. Yeah. He's getting all these opportunities and he's like not really dying yet, which I think is fucking hilarious because it's like, that's part of the reason why you're getting these opportunities. Yeah. You know, it's like part of me is jealous. It's like, I wish I could say that and then I could get a Netflix special and then be like, oops, <laughs> I guess I'm better. Um, so made a, you know, a comedic observation that like many com comedy people listening would be like, oh yeah, that's yeah, and lots it, it, of people would say that. It's a type of joke that could air on a Family Guy or could yes, have aired yeah, on exactly. Family Guy like ten years ago. Yeah, and definitely South Park uh, present day. Um, yeah. This kid was, I guess, and he, I guess, heard this special, and yeah, then he didn't. He didn't even hear this because I did this joke in uh, wrote the joke in like two thousand eight nine. And then I, I did it. Uh, I did a tour and that joke was in the tour. Then I did the special and um, uh, they, uh, they called, there's a thing called the Human Rights Commission here in Canada. And they called the Human Rights Commission and they wanted uh, money because of the joke. Like they didn't even want me to remove the joke. It was, they wanted money for the joke. And then the wow. human rights people uh, had a sort of, um, uh, they, they, 
they listened to, they came to one of my shows, listened to the joke, and then they decided that I should give 80,000 to this kid's family. Wow. And I, I refused and I hired a lawyer. Uh, we went to court and I lost and uh, the judge awarded uh, the kid 35,000 and the kid's mother 7,000. Wow. And then uh, I appealed that. Uh, we we w- took it to the appellate court. I lost that again. Ugh. And now, um, so, but now the, the appellate court said I only owed 35,000 instead of 42. And my lawyer was super happy. He was like, that's a victory. And I was like, that's not a victory. So uh, yeah. now I'm, I'm waiting on the Supreme Court. We were supposed to get news like uh, sometime in March, February, March if the Canadian Supreme Court was going to listen to my case. But then COVID came along and uh, no one no one cares about jokes when people think they're going to die. So I'm, I'm just waiting. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting on the Canadian Supreme Court. It's cost me so far a little over 300,000 <gasps> lawyer fees. Whoa. Uh, I had a, I had a, a GoFundMe because I ran out of money. Uh, and uh, so I did a GoFundMe, but then the Canadian, well, the Quebec media kind of screwed me because the, they wrote articles like, look at this millionaire comic uh, trying, to, trying to act like a, like a victim and blah, blah, blah. So we raised 35000 with that. Uh, the wow. uh, Montreal Comedy Festival, just for laughs, raised another fifteen. So they, so fans and and the festival gave me fifty, and I paid two fifty with uh, wow. with my manager. Wow! Could not pay so forty two. Way more fighting yeah. this than you have if you had just had yeah. laid down but and been like, sure, here. It was super yeah. important. Uh, like like for me, when when I when I got the. Um, the first verdict that said I had to pay 80,000. I met, I, like, I, I tried to find out who the best free speech lawyer was in Canada. And free speech is super important in the States. Like Americans realize how important free speech is. For some reason, Canadians don't really think about that or, or mm. never really do. So I was trying to find the best uh, free speech person in Canada. I hired him. And when I met him, I, he told me, he was like, look, you should just settle this out of court. And I was like, I, I didn't oh. want to like create a precedent. So I was like, I'd rather give you 100000 than give five to the, the Human Rights Commission. So I, I, I didn't know it was going to be 300000 But even if I knew, I still would have done it just out of principle. Yeah. I mean, I really, really respect that. Like, it's like you basically like, yeah, I'm going to go broke fighting for yeah. what I believe in here. Um, and it's, but it's I, a, I, don't, I don't have kids. I yeah. don't have kids. And, you know, so and I can I, I could like, let's say if I if I do lose in the Supreme Court, I'm still not going to pay. And uh, I'll, I'll wait for them to either put me in jail or seize my stuff. But, uh, you know, like I can do shows under the table. I can, you know, I can manage to, to you know, get fake companies to pay me or good for you <laughs> yeah so I'm you're like I'm, you're like I don't have kids so my beliefs are my kids <laughs> yeah exactly yeah exactly have you ever spoken to this Jeremy or like no. his mom right like they were demanding money for his mom yeah. because she was a mo- he was a minor at the time where he yeah. you know they, they first heard the joke and you know she had to be paid because she was like dealing with it which is such it, BS. It was really weird though, because I was watching a lot of uh, documentaries, like true crime documentaries on Netflix. And there was one thing I'd seen that oftentimes victims say the thing that they hate or victims' family is uh, whenever they look at the, the, the murderer or rapist or whatever, they were like, he, the, the rapist would never look at me. I wanted him to feel my pain. So when I was in court, I, was, I kept on staring at this kid's mom and staring at the kid just to see, like, so they could see that I'm not a monster. But yeah. they, they never looked at me. They, so I, I looked like a fucking weirdo or a bully. Because in court, I was just, like, staring at them the whole time. Wow. And uh, the mom, the only time she looked at me, like, when she was testifying, she started yelling at me. And I, I had uh, said something once in an interview that she was, like, a showbiz, showbiz mom. And... Uh, I, I guess I'd done a joke in an interview how she, she had bought a, 
a sports car with the kid's money instead of <gasps> getting him uh, like operated or wow. fixed or whatever you want to call <laughs> like fixed probably isn't the right he's term. He's fixed. Yeah. <laughs> he can't have kids. He's fixed. <laughs> but, but she looked at me and she, she was like, where is she? She started yelling. She, she opened her purse and she's like, if I had a sports car, where are the keys? And then she dumped all of her shit on the table and she's like, where are the keys? You and locked them in your me. car. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I was like, what? That is so fucking weird. Like, that what a weird point keys? to make a scene yeah. over yeah and a comment that i didn't even know i had made like then someone told me they were like i think you said that in an interview and i was like really and so it, it's it's just weird it's it's i don't know it's people living in the past that, that wanted to make money yeah it's 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 to me it seems like oh this they want to game the system like i feel like the mom it, yeah. to me it looks like the mom is like instigating this whole thing like you know 16 year old kid like you know with this horrible condition like guess what you're probably not the first person to to poke fun at it you know what i mean like yeah. it's not your fault that he gets bullied in school I, I i didn't buy that one bit like oh i got billy bullied it's like kids are not uh like high school kids are not listening to comedy specials i don't think yeah. i don't i don't kids are being kids they they in court they said that he had got bullied uh in school since 2005 but i i only wrote the joke in like 2008 or 9 so the first three years he got bullied because of me before i wrote a joke he like got those bullied kids, even because you were thinking about it yeah those <laughs> kids were like mike ward is thinking about making fun of this kid yeah what well, did how much do the kids him. how much do the, the school kids have to pay him yeah. out you know what i mean yeah. it's like it's like, where do you draw the line? It bothers me so much. Um, how has your act changed, if any, since this happened? Uh, it hasn't. Like, it, it's new jokes, because I, I don't still have the same jokes as 2009. That would be kind of weird. But um, it's, uh, I knew that if, if uh, like, at first when this happened, uh, I was like, two things can happen. Either I'll go super, super dark and hard with my comedy, or I'll just stop taking risks and become like a shitty, like Jay Leno type mm -hmm. comic. So I didn't want to become either one of those. So I stopped doing shows for like uh, a year. Like I only, wow. I, I still did shows, but I, I, I tried to figure out how much I needed just to pay my rent. And I figured that if I worked one week or, uh, a month, I could pay my rent. So I only worked one week a month for like a year and a half and I didn't write any new material. And then when I felt that uh, I was ready, then I wrote, I, I started writing and it hasn't changed it at all. Like nothing, nothing's, re nothing's changed. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Like you're still, it's still same sense of, hu sense of humor and stuff. Yeah. Like I've thought of, not that I've been like, sued by anybody yet uh but i've thought You'll about <laughs> like as i started like with i started i compound media like a year ago and uh, i just found that like my sense of humor really aligned with the guys on the network and i was like pitched a show it worked out like so thrilled like been so happy this whole time and i always thought like well you know maybe if i had adjusted my jokes and my persona somewhat maybe i could have had like a sweet late night spot by now you know because you these sets that you submit to like you know colbert for sure but you know well kimmel's like his show's done for the rest of the year yeah. um they just they go over your set so 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 many times and edit it and it's like for you to even get to that place you have to be kind of like deemed acceptable and but i've yeah. often thought like wow could i have had like more or better credits at this point if i had been a little bit different with my style and it's it's like sure you can do that for a couple of shows but for you to like make that change it's like you really do have to kind of like sell your soul it's like yeah. your voice is not your voice and anymore. plus like if if let's say you did do a, a colbert like who who's still watching tv like, no, so no yeah. one will see it. The only way people do see it is if, uh, like, when it's online. Yeah. But you can get, you can, like, film your own spot and put it on YouTube. And then they'll get, like, what you really do. But if you're, if you're changing everything to be on TV, then you're a shitty version of, of what you are. And no one wants to see that. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, it's like, it does a disservice to like the fans you already have who like you for you. And it's like any new fans you get from changing who you are, it's like, they're just going to fall away whenever you're going back to your real personality again. Um, so have you, you've never really spoken to Jeremy or his family? No, no, never. Uh, no. And even, um, like he, uh, like a couple of months ago, he, he he said something in an article that he'd like to do uh, a, a, a TV thing with me. And I was Ew. like, what, does he really think that after, you know, almost ruining my life and costing me a fucking fortune, I'm going to be like, hey, let's do TV together. That's so obnoxious because to yeah. me that really spells out like how, yeah, yeah, it is like a game for him, but also how it's like, maybe this whole lawsuit is not really in his heart. You know, if he was so offended by you and so his, if his life was ruined by something you said, yeah, he'd never want to see you again. He'd never want to be, but the fact that he wants to work on a project with you is like, you sound like such an opportunistic little schmuck. Yeah. It, that's really crazy. And the fact that this is a discrimination, like quote, a discrimination case, it's like, no, it's actually the opposite of that because true discrimination is like, oh, we don't make fun of this one group of people because they're special. There is no yeah. such thing as, you know, in comedy, everybody is game. Like you can, yeah. as you should, I think you should. That's what makes us all equal is that anybody can be made fun of in a comedy show. It's weird though. Cause when this happened, um, it, it was before the whole cancel culture thing. And whenever I talk to Americans, I was like, you guys are so lucky because you have the First Amendment. So you'll never get anything even close to this. But now you guys are going through the same thing. The only thing is it's not going to court. But, you you, you know, if Joe, people are getting, you know, their careers ruined because of yeah. jokes. Yeah. And it's all like taken out of context. Like it used to be, yeah. you know, when people talk about like, the glory days of comedy like 80s and 90s yeah you had to go to a club instead of the comedy being in your pocket it's in everybody's pocket whether they have a sense of humor or not and they're commenting on usually it's people with no sense of humor who would never go to a comedy club who don't follow comedians who don't who've never spent a dollar um supporting a comedian like they're the ones to shit on it tear it down and make it so that nobody else can it's ultimately the most selfish act is canceling it's like just because you don't like it doesn't mean and it's like you're in the the minority most people like you know like what you do or most people like what i do it's like it's just the one it's 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 so incredibly selfish and the the way that it kind of like bites us as americans is in the form of like public shaming trolling yeah like the online uh you know whatever canceling like so, uh people too like wh- whenever they try to cancel a comic they they shame the fans into feeling bad for liking that type of comedy but you can like retard jokes and be a super good person like yeah retard jokes uh, they're not all good, but some retard jokes are fucking amazing. That doesn't mean that because you laughed at a retard joke, you don't, you know, you, you hate people with Down syndrome. Yeah. It just it just says that you you, you think something. They're are funny. funny. Yeah. The retarded people are funny. Like I had my great uncle was retarded and like he was a blast, you know, <laughs> and he he like was a breach birth. This was like, he was my grandma's brother, right? So he wasn't supposed to live to 10. He lived to 82, you know? It's it's like same scenario, right? Like, especially back then, it's like nobody expected him to live as long, but he's, you know, a thousand cups of pudding later, still, still, still (laughs) at it. Is he still alive? No, no, God, no. I mean, like, yeah, he was 82. He must have died when I was like a young teenager. Okay. Um, yeah, I would go to the nursing home. Me and my sister would go to the nursing home and play our clarinets for all the people at the nursing home. And there was this one lady, like a few a few crazy people there for sure. There was this one lady who like came and like she would like, I was passing out cookies at a tray and he just, she just looked me dead in the eye, like grabbed the tray and wouldn't let go. And I was like, ah, and I was like 12 or something. And then that same lady, you know, she broke out of the nursing home and they found her in the middle of the street. She had picked up her wheelchair and thrown it up over her head. Really? Um, so yeah, there were a lot of fun characters. That's retard strength. What, right I was going to say, one might call <laughs> that a certain kind of strength. <laughs> but I think if my great uncle were still alive and if he could understand what I was saying, he would be like, go for it. Like, yeah. you know, 
he's not going to be offended. Um, I was thinking about that uh, this week, like how things have really changed. And just like the expression, remember when uh, someone that couldn't speak, we used to call him dumb? Yeah. Like it was deaf and dumb. And I was like, that's like, I can't believe that. Like, <laughs> that's how we call people that couldn't speak. You're yeah. Dumb. Like you're just dumb. <laughs> Instead, I wonder if like being a mute came after that. Yeah. Because there are mutes that are like <laughs> brilliant people, but you're like, all right, dummy. You know, if a bunch of dumb people that can't speak all rise up together, you know what that's called? A mutiny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I should go back to the retard jokes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so have you received any kind of backlash, public shaming, trolling as a result of all this? Uh, I did. I did at first, but um, I like I learned uh, kind of quickly not to not not to read all the hate. Like I, I, I went off social media for like six months. Wow. And even I stopped reading articles about me because this joke was um, this joke was done in French in in Quebec in French Canada. So the only people how that- fancy. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it, it was weird having uh, people from other countries and other languages uh, judging the joke and saying why the joke wasn't good. And I was like, you don't know this kid. You don't know how famous he was. You don't know the context. So it was just, it, it, it was tiring. Like I, I'd wake up in the morning and then I'd, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd Google myself to see what, what what people had written in the last 24 hours. And then I'd see there were articles in like, uh, in Russian. So, wow. and then I'd use Google Translate to find out the Russians thought I was a piece of shit. And I was like, <laughs> fuck them. So I just, I, I got off social media and got off the internet for like close to a year. And it, it helped me a lot, like really? mentally. When you got back on, were you ever tempted to like back search and like read up on? No, yeah. I, d yeah, no. And the, the one thing that I was really lucky is I got a lot of support from other comics. Like almost every, every pretty much every comic uh, said they supported me. And the ones that didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't like them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it didn't hurt. It's nobody you respect. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, I, I had a lot. Of, and I felt that like the first day in court, uh, first day I went to court, I hadn't talked to anyone about this. So um, no one knew about it. And uh, the day before uh, this kid put on his Facebook that he was going to court against me. So he had all of his fans in the, in the audience. So wow. or in the courtroom, I call them the audience, but anyway, the, in the courtroom. So it was me and my manager and um, my, my publicist and like 200 people that hated me. So it was very, very, very weird. But then the second day we went to court, then it was almost all comics that came out to support me. Oh, and good. that felt really good. Like, because it, it, at first it felt like the kind of the weight, of, like it's not the weight of the world, but that's how it felt like the weight of yeah, the world was on my up shoulders. On. But then uh, the second day when there was all the comics, it was really, it was, it felt good. And the first day in court, what was really funny was this kid's grandfather, they, uh, they aired the... They, they aired the joke in the courtroom, but um, <laughs> I, I told them I didn't want them to take the joke out of context. So I said the only way they could play it was if they, they played like the seven minute bit that it was from. So they played the whole bit. And when and when I got to the jokes about him, there was an old man laughing super loud. And it was this kid's grandfather. <gasps> and that made that me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> it made me so happy. So the kid's this... own grandfather is laughing at your material about yeah. his grand his grandkid. Yeah. You know, it would be so funny if you were like, you know, this courtroom, you're good. You guys are not really gonna understand this. We gotta hear this in context, and you just play like your latest special. Like you need you make everybody listen to like the full hour. <laughs> yeah, like, I you should, guys but just yeah. It, the, it was uh like Jimmy Carr had told me he was like, You shouldn't hire a lawyer, you should just try to defend yourself. It'll, you'll save money. And it like for wow. uh, marketing, it would have been good, but it just, I, I wasn't, it was weird having the government come after me. I wasn't in, um, uh, like I didn't have a mindset for 
trying to build my brand or whatever. I just wanted all of this shit to go away. Yeah. Cause it's very scary. Like I, you know, I've, I've never been sued and there's something a little bit scary about like any, anything legal. So the idea that you could even begin to represent yourself, especially with this much money involved yeah. is nerve wracking. Yeah. It bothers me so much because it's like, essentially what you're talking about when it, when you boil it down is like unfairness in life you know like this kid gets opportunities he wouldn't have normally gotten had he not taken advantage and promoted his like disease or whatever even if at the time he thought he was going to die if he like basically pimped out his disease and his, or his impending doom you know, like if he was just a kid that was like, yeah, I'm just going to go out doing what I love. But it's like him plus the mom. It's like they're a little bit gaming the system. They're taking advantage. Yeah. And it's like, you know, a year or two get, goes by or they, he keeps going to the doctor. Things are getting better. It's like he's not coming out and be like, wow, thanks for all these opportunities. Like, but I'm better. And so I no longer qualify as like this make-a-wish kid. Throw me back in the regular pool. Yeah. Like he is still, <laughs> I'm sure, fronting. Like he's, you know gonna die any day i mean we're all about to die any day so you know your joke really comes down to it's like yeah unfairness in life how everybody kind of you know or some people take advantage where they can to get what they want and i get like uh if if it wasn't me like uh it's a good way to make easy money like so i get i get why they're doing it because it, it, the, it's not them bringing me to court. It's the Human Rights Commission. So it's not costing them a cent. Wow. And then if they win, well, if they win, they, you know, they get all the money. Do you think Canada is like, has like a wokeness problem? Like kind of like it does here uh, in the U.S.? Kind of. The, well, there's one thing like Canada, since there's kind of two Canadas, there's a French Canada and English Canada. And um, I think... Uh, English Canada has has been like super woke and it's been horrible for comedy like England and Canada have been the worst places for stand up the last couple of years. Wow. French Canada isn't as bad but since we have the same legal system we're kind of fucked. But uh like a lot of jokes that work um in French Canada wouldn't work anymore in in english canada so how close like are there any clubs that are like oh wow like 10 minutes away you could be in english canada and if but if you go that oh, way yeah. you're in, wow. like um, montreal is divided there's a, a street called st lawrence and uh, east of st lawrence is all french west is all english so you can and, and i i did like when i uh my latest show, I have a bit uh, about trans people. And mm-hmm. I was doing it in French, and I, it, was, it was killing. And it's, it's a really good bit. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try it in English. Tried it in English, and it just fucking, I died on stage. Because everyone was so offended. And the, the jokes weren't even offensive. Like, it's not, it's not like uh, she-male jokes, like, ha-ha, I, I hate trans people. It, it's, but it, I think there are some... Like Canadian English Canadian audiences, sometimes they'll hear like some words and they they just their body shuts down. They stop listening. It's like yeah. it could be the, it could be a really funny joke, but it's yeah. something like it's something in our our like our brains, like in our like I don't know if it's brainwashing or like our indoctrination that like tells us, nope, this is a no no topic. You yeah. can't listen anymore. You're you're automatically offended. And it's like it sucks. It sucks that there are barriers to us listening and enjoying yeah. an act. And plus when, when I come out on stage, I'm the guy that got sued by the government for making fun of a disabled kid. So right away <laughs> I have like two strikes against Is it me. the credit you use when you uh, have people <laughs> intro you? <laughs> no, I should though. <laughs> I remember though when like when this first came out I I had a show in Toronto and this woman it it was this woman just went on a fucking rampage on Twitter I was doing a show with Andy Kindler and she was she kept on writing Andy Kindler do you realize what sort of monster is in your green room and then yeah and, and I was like that's crazy that I'm a monster for making fun not 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 even making fun doing a goddamn joke doing doing what i do for a living 
It'd be one thing if it was like not in a show, somebody just caught you on camera in your free yeah. time. You're just standing outside, a, like, you, you know, standing in a disabled parking spot, just waiting, <laughs> just yeah. waiting for somebody. To, but this is a joke. And uh, it's, it, it bothers me because it's like, oh, well, if this is okay, like, what else is okay? What other groups can we, can nobody ever talk about ever? You know, yeah. so it's like I, th I think it's really important that you're that you're fighting for this. I just and I'll think I'll eventually I think well fi if you would have asked me five years ago I was like I'm definitely gonna win when it goes to the Supreme Court but now I don't I don't really know anymore since we're like we're we're always judging things from the past with uh, our eyes today and right. when I did that joke like. It, there was no like it didn't offend anyone except for that kid and his mom but it's normal that it offends them because if if you do a joke about anyone you'll you'll offend them yeah but, but it, it wasn't an offensive joke it, it was fine people loved the joke and now but uh, 10 years later people are looking at it and going ah oh, we shouldn't make fun of disabled people we shouldn't make fun of this we shouldn't make fun of that it's like that's today like why yeah. you know what i mean like it's unfair to bring uh what happened with you like what now five years four or five years ago at this point like to today's standards and because yeah. because things have gotten so much more like i guess like woke and pc just in the last few years um, if you could go back, like knowing what you know now, like if you could go back, would you have just like, is there a part of you that like maybe would have settled? And no, 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 I wouldn't have settled. The only thing I regret, I, I regret um, like all of this started because I did an interview on TV. And uh, that's how the kid and his mom found out about the joke. The journalist had asked me um, about the joke to explain the joke. And, and he started off by saying that that joke was wrong and it went too far. Mm -hmm. And I knew the guy wasn't in the room when I said the joke. So I should have just said, okay, you want me to talk about the joke that you've never heard? And then yeah. talk about that. Because that's what I hate when, when people judge a joke. They, they, if they weren't in the room, they have no idea. Like, yeah. It's kind of none of their business. They weren't yeah. part of that show. Yeah. Um, you know. It's kind of like it, you lost out. Yeah. It's almost like doing a, 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 like a review of a restaurant that you've never been to. Yeah. Because had they, had they heard your, because you probably didn't, that probably wasn't your opening bit. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, yeah. you spend time as a comic setting the stage, charming the audience, getting everybody to like yeah. you so that when you go into your darker stuff, or your less PC stuff that that's the, that's the whole talent of being yeah. a comic is getting people to laugh at topics they normally wouldn't or getting people to laugh at things. Like if somebody else told the joke, even the same joke, they wouldn't have laughed, but because it's you and the way that you walk people through it and you get people to see the world, how you see it, that's what gets them to laugh. So right yeah. to be a reporter or somebody who wasn't there, didn't see it, doesn't, isn't familiar with your work, which I'm sure most of them aren't. It's like, it's icky and judgy. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to do a book review on a book I've never read or an author yeah. I've never met. And, um, but the thing I, I thought I was really lucky that this happened before, like now there's been a sort of divide with comics. Cause it used to be, yeah. Comics would always support other comics, no matter what, when it was a joke. Like if, if it's an exactly. off stage thing, like no one's going to defend a rapist or a pedophile or whatever. Right. But uh, like a couple of years ago, what, what happened to Shane Gillis? If this would have happened 10 years ago, 100% of the comics would have said, this is fucking crazy. He's, an, he's an amazing comic. Go fuck yourselves. He should be on SNL. But now like half of the comics are like, oh, that's the, you shouldn't make fun of Chinese people. And I'm I'm happy I went through this before that sort of divide, like I, that I you know I I felt the support of other comedians and that was super important. Why do you think um, comics are so divided right now? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if they. It's weird because when like when you do comedy, you realize that the like 
especially like in a green room, generally the darker the joke, the the more you laugh. Absolutely. And most the comics, more, yeah, the more fucked up, the better. Even even like super squeaky clean comics that could be like on the that could be on Colbert without changing a word in their act will fucking laugh at pedophile jokes mm-hmm. in the green room. And it, people used to get that. And but uh, I don't know, people don't anymore. Like, I think the way uh, people see us is more important than who we truly are. Right. Absolutely. Now. And I think a lot of comics are, are preoccupied with being, quote, on the right side of an issue or being yeah. like, I hate to keep saying PC, but like, Oh yeah, that they don't have a like a twisted bone in their body. They're you know, fully, fully. You know, I want I want everyone to know I'm fully bookable for anything. You know, like yeah. <laughs> don't look at me wa- laughing at this sick joke because uh, I want you to think of me for your kids' bar mitzvah. Um, and it's it's weird how free speech has become almost political the last couple of years because I I I used to consider myself kind of left leaning. I put yeah. the left just shit on me so fucking hard after after my my court thing that I was wow. like fuck the only people supporting me are the right so of course now like I'll I'll do more right like right leaning shows because those yeah. are the people that don't shit on me. Isn't that amazing? And I always considered myself like a classic liberal, and then the longer I did comedy. I was like, wow, it seems like the more conservative, more Republican people um, are bigger fans of comedy in general. Like they Mm. don't go to a comedy to sit there with their arms folded in in judgment. Like they want to have a good time. Uh, They're giving you the benefit of the doubt. They're following like the the compound media fans are great. They like, you know, I, I noticed my following went up you know, immediately and they, they're coming to shows. Now the same people have been coming to shows for years and I was like, wow, these are these are people who enjoy me. Like I'm gonna, you know, embrace them because it feels like and, and now it's like what used to be like the regular the regular left is like, okay, well now the radical left has just it's this big. It's like if you're yeah. not a radical lefty, then you might as well uh like be a Republican. Like they'll kick you right out the boat. Yeah. 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 It's hard. And it's it sucks that like comics can't because I agree with you. I feel like comics are not supporting each other like like they once did maybe like 10 years ago because I think mm. ultimately everyone's out for themselves. And I think a lot of people look at their fellow comic and see competition and not just somebody like in the family. You yeah. know, we're all trying to be the best we can be because I don't believe there's there's no such thing as a lack of opportunity. If, if even another redheaded girl comedian gets something I'm not going to go, oh, well, she took that from me. That's one less thing for me. It's like, no, yeah. I feel like whatever's meant for you will find you. And and as much as like what you're going through right now, like sucks so bad. Like, I, I just think you're you're setting such a good example. And it's like such a strong, like truly brave thing to do, because the easier thing would just be to like. Yeah, just to over settle. And be scared. Every, yeah. But everyone that told me at first, like you should settle was always people with money that I didn't respect their values. So, and it, it's weird saying that the reason why I went to court because it was because of my values. Cause it's weird saying I made, I, I wanted to defend me making fun of a handicapped boy <laughs> because of my values. But it, it was just, I think it's important. And I'm not even defending the joke, even though I, I still think the joke is super good, but it's just the idea of a joke. Government should never, tell us what we can and can't say like even even if it's even if it's racist even if it's homophobic even like uh, government government should fucking not not tell comics what to do yeah government needs to stay out of your thoughts and out of our art uh i think like yeah the market gets to decide you know if you keep doing that joke if no one laughs at that one joke ever you're gonna stop doing it if it never works in any room that's how jokes you know get out of people's routines if enough people are like truly offended you're gonna stop doing it but if people are still laughing at it guess what like you're you're letting people's real sense of humor dictate most comics are letting the audience in a way dictate the audience response is dictating which jokes you keep and which jokes you toss 
So it's yeah. like, oh, then are you going to get into, you know, suing somebody for laughing at a joke? So it's like, oh, the comic gets sued. And now anybody in the audience who laughed that you guys are also in deep shit, too. That's kind of what they tried to do with Joe Rogan a couple of weeks ago with uh, Joey Diaz's thing that uh, people were trying to like, well, they, they'll never be able to cancel Joe Rogan. But they, they were saying, like, look at how shitty he is for laughing. You can't control what you laugh at, especially exactly, when you're with a friend. I thought, I thought that they were they wanted to cancel Joe Rogan because he was like friends with Dalia and um, Brian Callen. Was it so? Was it was something different? No, it was something different. It was uh, Joey Diaz said that he had a story about he did a story like in 2012 about when he was starting out in comedy that uh, girls to get on his show would have to suck his dick. Oh, okay. And then Joe just laughed. And then people were like, look at Joe laughing. And he's talking about rape. And you're like, "Uh, he wasn't talking. It it was like, the way he said it, it it seemed like a joke. So if someone, if a comedian is telling you something that seems like a joke, and, and then you it's think probably it's funny, a joke. Yeah. And so, yeah. So if someone, is, if a comic is telling you a joke and you laugh, that doesn't make you a bad person. No. And it doesn't make Joey Diaz a bad person for doing that joke. We can't, we can't control, try controlling a laugh. Like, you know, it's, it's yeah. still going to come. It's still going to sneak out. And if you, if you're like approaching life suppressing what brings you joy like that's kind of a sad thing you know it's like we can't help what we laugh at so it's yeah. like the people who are creating joy like to to put to make those people the bad guys like that's really sad and i think the people that are this fucking human rights commission is like not looking yeah. it's also a human right to like laugh it's also a human right to make observations about the world that other people agree with and can bond over. You know, it's also a human right to like, oh yeah, like X, Y, Z situation sucks, but like we're all like in it together. The, the fucked up thing too about the human rights commission in Quebec, the, the, when I was in court, two of the employees got caught in pedophilia scandals. Wow. The, the former president of the human rights commission and uh, some investigator so, and I was like, these motherfuckers are bringing me to court because I'm a bad person for making fun of a little kid. And yet they're, they're having sex. Like the people judging me thought it was okay to fuck little kids. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. What a weird world. That's so crazy. Oh, because like you're out in the open where everybody can see you and they're yeah. shady and doing it like in an underground tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well... God damn it, Mike Ward. I'm so, I don't know. So, so it's going to the Supreme Court, I guess, whenever. Yeah, whenever this well, is over. calm down, which yeah. could be never. <laughs> yeah. It's weird, too. Like, <laughs> by the time it goes to the Supreme Court, because even now, this is a joke I wrote more than 10 years ago. So I don't even remember writing that joke. So there's something bizarre about defending something that you did 10 years ago. Yeah, but yeah, here we have like, um, God, all these celebrities who even did blackface for a minute. Kimmel did did blackface. Jimmy Fallon pretended to be Chris yeah. Rock. There was a scene in the Golden Girls in which they wore like mud masks. These were all all like sort of cancelable offenses. And how old that? Even more than ten years ago, yeah. a lot of these examples. It's really a, a waste of everybody's time. You know, it's like it's one thing to to do a thing like today although i would say you still have a right to do it but it's like if, if yeah. people aren't laughing at it that should be your only indication yeah. of what somebody tells you you know yeah like i'm yeah tech like you should be allowed to do blackface but i wouldn't recommend it because you're definitely yeah, <laughs> yeah. no one's it gonna seems be like, like the risk reward it's i <laughs> yeah. feel like that's gonna be a net negative experience <laughs> yeah no one's no one's gonna get a special because someone saw you wear a black face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're going to, sure, you'll have some fans. You'll have some people that'll, but I don't know if that's going to be enough. <laughs> yeah, if that's your thing, if you're, a, you're like, I'm going to be a comedian in 2020 and I'm going to be a black face, that's going to be my thing. It's like, you might not be able to sell out of theater. You know, you might not. But it's like the market should decide, like, let, what are people laughing at? Because, like, where does it end? If you're wrong for telling a certain joke, 
how far away are we from well you're wrong for laughing at it mm. and it's like i don't know yeah. that now we have to be like reprogrammed it's like it's scary it's gross i always feel though like it's coming back but then something happens that i'm i'm not even sure if it's coming back but i know for audiences a couple years ago i noticed and i think it was just because because of my court thing a lot of my jokes that used to work weren't working anymore because people mm. were more easily offended. And then like a uh, year or two ago, I felt that uh, audiences were back to where they used to be. I think it swings like the, the one, one comic will do something offensive, then everyone gets offended for a while. And then audiences get sick of having like a PC police tell comics what to do. So yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a weird time in comedy. Yeah, I did a um, joke on Twitter. Like they were, it was like a trending topic that there would now be a black national anthem that would play before NFL games, I guess whenever they get started up again. And I just think the idea that any group gets to have a separate national anthem is like absurd. Like there's yeah. one national anthem because it's one nation. And uh, so I like, I retweeted the, uh, the moment or the story or whatever. And it was like the black national anthem was the headline. And I go, I was like, my tweet was just, so what just sirens, you know, like, cause that was my, <laughs> and I didn't even say like, you know, I didn't specify, I just kind of left it at that. And I was like, I like let it fly. And I was like, Oh, this could be risky. But I was like, <laughs> I also really think it was really funny. And, and I'm yeah. just, you know, there's maybe like a couple of haters, but what I love to see was like, fans or people that thought the joke was funny or even people that thought the joke was not that funny but they also believed that it was not racist like defending in their replies and that like really made me feel good because i was like oh wow like i yeah. the fans will kind of come out and i defend. think i think in the long run funny will always win yeah yeah and you're you're super funny so like and you will get into trouble because <laughs> it's like but i think since you're funny you'll get out of it I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're super funny too. It just really, it's like upsetting that this is happening. And I wonder, yeah. you know, do you have any idea maybe like how much more, my hope is that it'll just get pushed off. Like, well, this isn't important anymore because it's Corona times and yeah. um, it's small potatoes, but. Yeah. I, I, that, uh, the only thing is my lawyer had told me he was like uh, the human rights commission or, or sorry, the Supreme court, has 30 days to accept or refuse uh, the case. And it's been like six months. So I should call my lawyer. I just never do because whenever I call him, it costs me like $95. Oh, wow. So like at first, that was the thing that used to piss me off at first because he's uh, 800 bucks an hour. <gasps> so my, my manager yeah. would call him sometimes just for questions that he could have Googled. Like, uh, oh. well, what time do we show up? And I was like, you fucking idiot. Don't, don't ask them what time we show up at. Just Google what time to show up at and show up. So now I never call them anymore, which, so which I should. You could Google this. What about texting? What does he charge per text? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, he, see, he's an old man. I don't even know if he has a, well, I guess he does have a cell phone, but I never texted him. Yeah. And maybe it's by the word. I don't know. Oh I should. God. Yeah. Or I maybe should just it's like, them. um, it's like Scrabble where like, if it's a Q, like that's, yeah. that's more points. And if it's he could triple. just use his simple nouns, it's less money. Oh my God. I should text him. How much, how much is this text worth? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So what are you working on now, Mike? Are you, where can people find you uh, everything coming up right now? I have a, I have a tour that's on hold, uh, in French, uh, in, in French Canada in Quebec called Noir. Um, I, I am, I have my French podcast called Mike Ward Suzy Good. I have the English podcast to drink minimum with Pantelis that we do shows, uh, on compound media and shows everywhere. So YouTube, uh, wherever you get your podcast. And I put out a special like a year ago called infamous and it's on YouTube. So if you want to see, uh, I guess it's, uh, people call it now old school comedy because I, I don't give a fuck and which is an old school way of doing comedy, but it, it's the way I think you should do comedy. I don't think any comedian should give a fuck. I think it's like, yeah. that's part of being honest and telling it yeah. like it is. Cause if you want filtered and careful, guess where you can find that? Like literally everywhere there's yeah. fake news all around us and, uh, people are too polite, but I, I think, um, uh, 
you know, now I think it's a little crazy now, but I eventually think this sort of like the pendulum will swing back. And, and just from what I've seen in these sort of like secret shows is that audiences are really ready for comedy and they're like, they're wanting it. Like they want yeah. it just like, they want people to be real with and, and laugh with and like, you know, enough with the BS. Cause I think it trickles down too, because people are not trusting our government as much. And what we're hearing on the news, it's like, okay, so we want, we're craving honesty and realness. Mm. And that's what you get from stand up from comedy. comedy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, this is awesome. Mike, thank you yeah, so much for coming talking. on the show. Thanks and for every, having me. Everybody follow Mike. Check out his special Infamous. It's a special uh, only of disabled jokes. Uh, you guys are exactly. going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> and Thanks. the second half is all in blackface. Oh, God. wow. That's something it's for really everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. All right. Thank you. Bye.